California has rules for what they call small estates. So if you have an estate that is what's considered a small estate under the statutory rules, you can minimize or avoid probate depending upon what you own. For personal property, the current amount is $184,500. So if I own personal property less than $184,500 and I die, my heirs can use an affidavit to take over my property without a probate. So there's this, there's a chart, a really big <laughs> chart that's set out in the code, right? So um, if you die with a spouse and no parents and no kids, your spouse gets everything. If you die with a spouse and a parent or parents and no kids, then they split it. If you die with no parents, but a spouse and kids, if you have one kid, it's 50-50. If you have more than one kid, the spouse gets a third. Hi everybody, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Group Show. Today we have a repeat guest. The name is Jennifer Felton. She works for ReLaw. Uh, she is the owner. Today she is going to be going over what is the probate process in California. We're gonna be going everything from start to finish and then the great thing about it is that it is explained by a local attorney here in california we're going to give you tips whether you have to go through probate when you don't have to go through probate and we're just going to basically explain the entire process so welcome back to the show jennifer how are you i'm good how are you jose good good for our viewers that are new to the channel who aren't familiar with you, who is Jennifer Felton and how did you get involved in real estate law? So I started my professional career actually as an escrow officer. So I did transactional real estate for 15 years and then uh, went to law school and transitioned into being a real estate attorney. So my whole career is focused on understanding title and uh, managing property, helping businesses and people with real estate uh, resolve their problems and deal with the things that come up in real estate, including people dying. Unfortunately, it's part of the deal. So, and it, it, it impacts title all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, good. I actually didn't recall that you worked as an escrow officer. I, I think that makes you an even better attorney because obviously you understand that aspect of it. There's a practical side and a legal side, which is, is where, where we bring a different perspective. I think. Yeah. I love it. So let's say, cause this happens to me quite a bit. Somebody passes away, they own a property, and I get a phone call sometimes saying, hey, I want to sell the property fast or I want to sell it. And a lot of times they don't realize that depending on whether they left the trust, depending on whether they left the will, depending on how the property was held, there's so many different variables. So somebody dies, what questions should somebody be asking to determine whether or not they'll be going through the probate process? Right. So the first step is figuring out who's on title and how they're on title, right? So if we have an heir, right, generally the kids, right, are calling because they want to sell the property. Uh, the first thing we should do is get a title search, right? Get a copy of the, the most recent deed to find out who's on title um, and how they're holding title. So if if mom and dad were on title and only dad died, maybe it's mom's house now, right? Um, if, if dad decided to add one of the kids on title, maybe it's one of the kids' houses now, right? Maybe if they've left it and they're solely on title, uh, maybe a widow, right? Mom, you know, dad passed away. Mom's now on title as a widow. Now we're going to have to deal with some form of probate. Um, if it's in a trust, a trust will avoid probate. If it's in an entity, right? Maybe mom and dad had a corporation and the house is in a corporation. We're not going to probate with a with an entity owner. So our first step is figuring out who is the legal owner and then determining what the options are based on that. So if it's an entity, it actually doesn't go through the probate process? No. I entities entities live until you kill them, right? They're Entities live forever. So just so for example, right, I own a law firm, my law firm is a corporation. If I die, that corporation continues to be a valid and active entity, someone will have to take over my role at the company, but it wouldn't be a probate for as far as the business and how it's run, someone would have to take over um, the 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 role as the shareholder or the member in an LLC situation. 
Now, th this is a common misconception. I get people that tell me, well, my dad had a will. Does the will eliminate the probate process? Nope. <laughs> so a will is, in, you should have a will, right? So if you don't have a trust, and honestly, even if you have a trust, you should have a will um, because of what's called intestate succession rules, but a will does not avoid probate, okay? So the only individual type ownership that avo avoids probate is a trust. Got it. Now, um, if let's say somebody dies without a will or somebody dies without a trust as well too, mm -hmm. but let's say the property is a mobile home and it's mm -hmm. in the desert, do <laughs> they still have to go through probate or not? Maybe. <laughs> so there's, um, California has rules for what they call small estates. So if you have an estate that is what's considered a small estate under the statutory rules, you can minimize or avoid probate depending upon what you own. For personal property, the current amount is $184,500. So if I own personal property less than $184,500 and I die, my heirs can use an affidavit to take over my property without a probate. For real estate, you still have to go through the probate process. The dollar amount on real estate is $61,500. So maybe that mobile home <laughs> in the desert is worth less than $61,500. With real property, because of the title rules, we have to still go to probate court. So we go to probate court and a probate um, referee, which is like an appraiser, has to value the property. And as long as the value comes in below that 61500 then um, the court will order it distributed without a full probate, right? But those are the only two circumstances where we can avoid probate in this kind of scenario. Got it. Now, here's one thing that I've seen very commonly. Somebody sets up their living trust. Mm -hmm. They want to refinance the property. When they're <laughs> refinancing, it gets taken out of the living trust title yep. and then they forget to put it back in if that were to happen do they mm -hmm. still have to go through the probate process and if so is that any different than a traditional probate so the the property because it's in the wrong title right not what they intended um, it does still have to go to court and we still go through probate court but there's a motion that you can file we call it a hegstead petition um, hegstead is the name of the first case where this happened you know, things get called by the people who created them, right? So this family, the they had meant to be it be in a trust. It wasn't in the trust when they died. They filed a motion. The court approved it and put it into the trust. Because understand, people do this, like they'll go to LegalZoom or some, you know, online do-it-yourself trust, right? And they'll create a beautiful trust, but they won't what's called fund the trust. So funding the trust means putting the properties you own in the trust. So your car, right? The things you own, your life insurance, maybe, right? You have to have to make the trust the owner of those things, including your real estate. So if, if I say my house is in my trust, but the deed isn't in the name of the trust, I haven't funded my trust. Or like your example, so I refied, I came out of the trust. I didn't put it back into the trust. So I didn't refund the trust. Okay, so this is a limited probate for that purpose to get it into the trust um, so that you can avoid probate. And think about it, if we don't avoid probate, if that if it's not in the trust, we may have totally different beneficiaries because the trust may say, I want these people to have it. If the trust, if it's not in the trust, it's going to go by what's called intestate succession rules. California has this list. So different people are in different priority to inherit your stuff if you die that the state decides not you um so it might go to someone you didn't want it to go to right and so really important in a way to try and get things into the trust yeah what i was going to ask you that was actually my next question like let's say that you die without a mm -hmm. trust who how do you determine who gets appointed as the administrator is it the oldest child is it the middle child and what happens if multiple people are petitioning to get appointed it's whoever files first is usually the case, right? Um, you know, in most family situations, there's that dominant sibling, right? Who's like, oh yeah, I'll take care of it. Um, but there are disputes. So I, there are, 
it's not uncommon for there to be a dispute over who's going to be the administrator if there wasn't a will, right? If there's a will, the will will appoint what's called an executor. Executor is an appointed person by the the person who, you know, ultimately passed away. An administrator is appointed by the court, right? So you'll hear the term letters um, when we're talking about probate. The first thing we do is file a probate um, petition. And in part of that, we ask the court to issue what are called letters. The letters give the person who's managing the estate power to act. Um, letters ex uh, uh, letters of, of administration are when there's no um, will. Letters with an executor is when there is a will. So you're, you'll have different terminology depending upon who is getting appointed and how. Yeah. How important is it to set up a trust? Um, if you own anything, <laughs> it's important. <laughs> well, here's kind of what I'm thinking about. Like uh, I've been involved in hundreds of probate cases and I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of different things. I've seen it where the title, there's no will, there's no trust. Mm -hmm. And he separated from his ex-wife. But the ex-wife mm -hmm. is on title still, so they never get divorced. I've seen it where stepchildren mm -hmm. uh, happen. So I think mm -hmm. that if you own anything, like Jennifer said, our advice <laughs> is just set up a living trust and make sure that this gets taken care of. Here's what yep. I wanted to ask you. Let's say somebody does not have a will, no living trust. What is the succession for beneficiaries? Like, meaning if I have, like, let's say I don't have any of that and I have a stepdaughter, does she get money? Mm -hmm by law or does she not get money like how does that work so there's this there's a chart a really big <laughs> chart that's set out in the code right so um if you die with a spouse and no parents and no kids your spouse gets everything if you die with a spouse and a parent or parents and no kids then they split it if you die with no parents but a spouse and kids if you have one kid, it's 50-50. If you have more than one kid, the spouse gets a third and the kids get two thirds, no matter how many there are. If those don't exist, then it starts to go to siblings, then nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles. It, and like, uh, it gets really complex because like I have a case where the guy died. He didn't have any kids. His siblings were all dead. So like we got like great nieces getting like one sixteenth of <laughs> the property, right? These these very spread out and this guy left millions, right? So they're getting like, you know, a piece of a million millions, right? Under this, this process. So it, it is all controlled by, by um, statute and there's no discretion. The court can't say, Oh, he didn't like this kid. So this kid doesn't get it. Um, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> so you can, you can through a will, which again, we're still going to be in probate with a will, but you can disinherit or control who gets your stuff with a will. Um, but it, again, the court's going to still administer that estate. So the most important thing, either least bare minimum, set up a will. If Correct. they don't set up a will, set up a trust, but at mm -hmm. least this way you get to determine how you want your money to go versus right. having the state determine how it goes because that's only going to cause more uh, potential issues. Okay, so let's say that uh, we've already determined who's going to file, who the petitioner is going to be. What is the first step uh, after they talk to an attorney? Like, what does that meeting look like with an attorney? Right, so you're going to sit down with the attorney. We're going to get the information about the person who passed away. We need to know everybody who is a potential beneficiary because we have to notify everybody of the probate. Not only do we know, notify every every potential beneficiary, we actually have to publish in the newspaper. So we have to put public information out there notifying people of the death. That's a process. And so probate takes two to three months to get started mm -hmm. while we're doing that. We'll file the paperwork with the court and then we'll be doing all of these things on the back end. And then we'll have our first hearing. And the first hearing, assuming no one's fighting and there's, you know, a normal situation, the court is going to appoint an administrator and they're going to issue those letters that I was talking about. So there's different types of letters that you can get in California. There is what's called full authority and limited authority. So 
if you have a will, generally the will will say the administrator will have full authority. Um, without a will, the court's going to decide. If there's disputes or um, there's a bond requirements when we have a probate, if the administrator is not going to be able to get a bond, um, then we're going to get limited authority. That's going to impact, like, if we have a real estate transaction going going on behind the scenes, right? So this estate has, you know, maybe some cars, some stocks, some real estate, right? And they're, they're all part of these this estate. The real estate, if we have limited authority, we're going to need a court order before we can close that sale. If we have full authority, we can close it and not get court authority. So all of these things have huge consequences on how quickly we can dispose of a property. Maybe we need cash. Maybe the property's in foreclosure. Um, maybe the property has a reverse mortgage on it. If we have a reverse mortgage, which is common with seniors, um, once they die, that mortgage goes into foreclosure, right? So there's we got it. We got we got to get moving. We got to pay that lender off. We got to deal with that property. Got it. And then um, can somebody actually file in pro per or by themselves? And what advice, like, I don't ever recommend that just because um, it's a very complex system. Uh, what are your thoughts on somebody doing that? Can they? And what are your thoughts on that? And what advice or what what have you seen? You can absolutely do, do it yourself, right? Like, our legal system does have ways to do that. If, you're, if your income or resources are low, there are, like um, – Ventura County here has a, like a, a low income uh, legal department at the courthouse and they'll help you with filling out paperwork. If you qualify, you have to meet certain criteria um, and they'll help you out. Um, there, there are some pro bono or uh, low income services that you can use if you need that, but you have to qualify generally for those. Um, with probate, if there's property, there's money, right? There's, there's assets in that estate in most cases. Um, probate fees for attorneys are set by statute. So we are capped at how much we can charge. Um, so we can't just charge whatever we want. A million dollar probate, the attorney fees around seven grand, right? So you get a sense of what you're talking about. It's not crazy. Um, it's, it's money, but it's, and the administrator and the um, attorney get the same fee. So, um, uh, those are that's kind of how the system works. But again, there's you can go online. There's online calculators. Understand attorneys write the rules, <laughs> right? They're the legislators. So the value of the estate is based upon the value of the assets, irrespective of loans. So if I have a million dollar house with a nine hundred thousand dollar loan, I only have a hundred thousand in assets, right? Because I got to pay off the nine hundred thousand dollar loan. It's still a million dollar probate. Right. So again, attorneys write the rules. So we want to get paid on the value of the assets. Got it. And then, and I think this is something that a lot of the administrators actually don't know that the administrators can actually receive a fee. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, and most statutory. administrators don't realize that. Yeah. That they yep. actually can. Do they have to receive a fee? They do not. The, the attorney doesn't have to receive a fee either. <laughs> Um, but I don't know very many attorneys who will do it without a fee. Um, uh, but nobody can take their fees until we're at the end. So one of the things with probate is, um, if I take on a probate case, I don't get paid till the end. Um, I have to get a court order ordering and authorizing the payment of the legal fees, just like the, and the administrator is the same way that gets done at the end of the probate, not at the front end. And a probate can be a two year long process. So you're doing all that work with the with the payment coming at the end. So upfront costs for us is part of the deal with doing these things. Got it. Now, uh, for somebody considering being the administrator of the estate, maybe if they're watching this video, what duties does that administrator have? And is there any liability as being the administrator of an estate? Yes, there are duties and there are liabilities. So um, it is not something you should take on without appreciating that. So your your duties as the administrator are to manage the assets of the estate. So the concept in the law is called marshalling. You got to collect all of the assets. And then based upon the distribution rules, you got to then distribute them to the right people. 
There are tax obligations relative to an estate. So you got to make sure that the taxes get paid. If, if you distribute the assets and don't pay the taxes, the IRS will come back after you for the taxes, right? Um, and if you cheat or do something wrong, you make even a mistake, you are a fiduciary. So you have fiduciary duties to the beneficiaries. So they could sue you for breach of fiduciary duty. So um, we were, you know, with siblings, self-dealing, right? If you if you do that, it's going to come back. There's going to be consequences to to doing that and just preserving the assets of the estate. So, you know, if, if there's, if like we're worried about a foreclosure, if you're not stopping that foreclosure and mitigating that risk and the asset gets lost in foreclosure, that other beneficiaries could come after you for not properly managing. So it is, there is response. That's part of why there's a fee, right? There is responsibility. Um, so it needs to be, and that's part of why there's a bond requirement <laughs> because we need responsible people managing other people's assets. Got it. Now, um, when you say self-dealing, what does that mean? Um, it means, you know, giving yourself more than you're entitled to, right? So if I'm, you know, if my parent dies and I'm administering the estate and I take take more for me than my siblings, that's that's not okay, right? That's that's self-dealing. Perfect. Okay. And then um, what are some of the things like, and I kind of skipped over this, what are some of the things, because sometimes I get people that parent dies on a Saturday, on Monday, they're already clearing out the property, throwing things away, like basically taking possession. What are mm -hmm. things that people maybe shouldn't do before determining who's on title and how things are going to progress? Like, is it okay to start selling things at that point? What's right? What's wrong? What are some of the mistakes that you've seen uh, when doing this? I would wait till you have authority <laughs> to do anything. That's my opinion as an attorney, right? Um, and, and you gotta, you, again, you gotta figure out who is on title to things. So, um, and you know, something like if I want to enter into a real estate contract with you to sell the house, I, I, if, if I, my mom died, right. And I'm her daughter and I'm a, I'm a, I happen to be an only child, right. So I'm her heir. Um, I couldn't just go sell her property, right. I can't sign for her. I can't enter into a contract to sell that property, until I have authority from the court to do that if she wasn't didn't have her property in a trust. So if I go trying to sell cars or or jewelry or, or even disposing of things, I could be impacting other people's rights and have risk and liability. Are our step brothers and stepsisters beneficiaries? Generally, yes. It it again, you gotta there's a whole list and yeah. it depends. There's like did you get divorced? Did there, did someone die? Did, right. There's, did they adopt them? Did they not adopt them? There's a whole <laughs> section of that. There's a whole com convoluted thing. Got it. Okay. And then at what point can they actually sell the property? Again, once we have letters, you're going to have authority to contract, right? So you can enter into a listing agreement. You can enter into a purchase agreement. You can enter into a lease, right? You can start acting with the assets at that point. Um, you do not have to get, we do not have to wait until the end of the probate to sell property. People all have a misconception that, oh, it's, you know, someone died, it's gonna take me two years before I can sell it. No, no, no. It's gonna take you two or three months to get authority. But once we have authority, we can sell that property. Now we may have to manage the proceeds, right? Those may need to be set aside, um, but but you can sell actually pretty quickly. Yeah. And it's funny because I've, I talked to people that are in the process like, oh no, my attorney said that I couldn't sell until the probate is complete. But really when they receive the letters of administration, that's the time that they can enter into some sort of contract with a real estate agent or a contract to sell or whatever um, that may uh, be at that point. Is there uh, cause I've had people that their attorney recommends that they wait until the probate gets closed out. Does that add more liability? Because at that point, then you're transferring the asset into their personal name. Sometimes it, there's a whole, there's a whole, um, debate and, um, kind of there's different theories on this. Um, 
it, it really depends on what the plan is. If a family member is going to take over the property, right, well, then we're going one way. Um, if we're going to try to keep it maybe as a family asset, and now the siblings are going to rent it out. That's one way to go. If you're if you're going to sell it, in my opinion, I would sell it and not and not ever put it in title of the children. But there there are multiple philosophies of different people from a tax and liability standpoint. But that's my preference is if we're going to sell it, sell it. If you if you're planning on selling it and you put it under your personal name, that adds a layer of potential liability now. Right. Because you're it no does. longer protected by the probate process, because in a probate, you're not technically the owner of the property. You're the representative right. of the estate. Now, when you take it under your own name, now you're the owner of the property. Right. It has it has impacts relative to do your disclosure obligations, right, of what we have to disclose. Um, that's one of the other things people will say, oh, you know, so, you know, often properties of someone who's passed away haven't had the proper maintenance done to them. Right. As someone gets older, they may not have the resources or the wherewithal to maintain the property. So it might need work. Right. Well, if you choose to take on that work, which some states do, now we take on the liability of that work. Right. So you have to weigh the cost benefit of analysis of how much am I going to spend to fix it up and what will it be worth more versus um, the if I sell it as is, I have a way less liability. Right. So there's there's a lot of factors that go into uh, making these decisions and having, a, you know, a real estate agent like you guiding them through the process to weigh the, the benefits and deficits is really important. Basically, in some cases, the liability may not be worth it, and that you also get added liability. So talk a little bit about disclosures. So whenever mm -hmm. it's in a probate, is there yep. more disclosures than when somebody owns it, or is there less disclosures? There's less, actually, <laughs> because the person who's selling it didn't live in the property. Right. So they're not going to be held to the standard of an owner who knows that the plumbing's leaking or the windows leak or when it rains, you know, this thing happens or the wind rattles these windows. Right. You're not you're not held to that same standard. So there's actually um, we in California, we have what's called the TDS, the transfer disclosure statement. Um, when the estate sells it, it's exempt from the TDS. They do not have to do that disclosure. There is still, they, they're not, it's not zero disclosures, but they're, 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 there's actually a, it's called an exempt seller disclosure. The car form is the ESD, right? Um, and it's significantly less <laughs> that has to be disclosed because they're exempt, right, from the disclosure obligations. But as soon as you take possession or you start doing things to it, you're not exempt anymore. Got it. Okay. Now, is it possible, like, let's say I am the sole beneficiary, I'm the only son, uh, I mm -hmm. found a real estate agent that I want to work with, could me and that real estate agent enter into a, a listing agreement that is subject to that person receiving letters of testamentary, as long as it's subject to them receiving letters of testamentary, or letters of administration? And what are your thoughts on that? It wouldn't be binding. Right. And it because it, 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 they can't contract to sell that house because they don't have authority. So you can you can agree in principle, but until they have authority and then affirm the agreement. Right. You, you don't have a that's contract. when it becomes bang, binding at that point. Correct. I love it. OK, good. Now, you talked about the principle of a bond as well, too. I to be quite honest, I've never really understood that principle of a bond. Yeah. Like, why is there a bond required? How does the bond process work? Like, mm -hmm. meaning like, do I have to put up a lot of money? Which companies offer the bond process? Can you kind of explain mm -hmm. the bond process as it relates to probates? Yes. <laughs> so um, if there's, if the court believes there's risk relative to the transaction, they're going to require a bond. Again, generally a will will waive the bond requirement, um, but without a bond, uh, without a will, it's not uncommon for there to be a bond. So it'll be based upon the value of the estate and there are bonding companies, right, that will issue the bonds. You have to apply and you have to have good credit. <laughs> they, they, it, it's like when someone's going to jail <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, they, it, you know, they want to get out on bonds. The, the bonding company is, is guaranteeing the money to the court if the 
the person does not perform. So they're going to require someone that they trust, right? It's like getting a credit card, right? You, you got a credit card for, for this. Cause if, if you, if I am the administrator and I'm a bad guy and I sell the house and run off with the million dollars, right? The bonding company is going to have to cover that, right? They've bonded and guaranteed that estate for whatever amount the bond amount is, right? Um, and so that's where that process comes in. So if we can't get a bond, which I've had cases where the administrator did not qualify, you can either try to get a change the administrator or um, in, in some cases, the attorney will agree to be the administrator and do the bond. Um, uh, we have done it. And in those cases, the money comes into my trust account because <laughs> if I'm on the hook for it, right, I got to hold on to it. Um, or you get limited authority. So if if we can't get a bond, then we're going to have limited authority, which means everything we do needs court approval. Got it. Um, so there are certain administrators who may not qualify. Do you know what these requirements are? Like, do they look at the credit report? Do they, they look do. at how many assets you have? Like, what are they typically looking for? Yeah, we, it's an application. Like I said, it's kind of like applying for a loan or a credit card. Wow. Um, and there's a process. So we, we've had to do it multiple times. Uh, most of the time it's not a problem. Um, and the bond will, it's not, it's not free. Right. You're going to pay for the bond, uh, depending upon, again, how much they're insuring on a transaction. So I think we had one. The bond was, you know, three, four thousand dollars a year, something like that. It's real money. Got it. OK. Now, limited authority. Um, mm -hmm. Do limited authorities transactions require court confirmation? And what does that they actually do. mean? Yes. So when we have limited authority, we're going to we're going to list it. And there's actually a different car form to use for a probate with a limited authority because it's going to have a, this contingency relative to the court approval process. So you're going to you're going to put it on the market. You're going to get offers. You're going to accept an offer and then you're going to go to court and get a hearing. And then at the hearing, the court is actually. Um, have you ever heard of overbid? <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. an overbid process, right? Um, so the we're going to take that offer to the court, but other people can show up at the hearing and bid more than what the original person agreed to buy it for. So say we're talking about our hypothetical example. Um, I'm selling my mom's property and you decide you enter into a purchase agreement to buy it for a million dollars. We go to court. The court says, okay, we're open for bids. Jose's bid a million dollars. Anyone want to bid a million dollars, 50,000, right? And someone says yes, and they'll, they'll bid. And it can go up at the courthouse. So assuming it does, and assuming someone bids more than you're willing to buy it, the court will say, all right, we're selling it to Bob instead of Jose for a million one, right? Now think about this from a practical standpoint. I got a purchase contract with a totally different buyer, I, I right? <laughs> so, and I got an escrow and a title, right? And now all of a sudden, and I got a whole bunch of terms that now I got to get Bob to agree to, right? It's crazy, but it's, this is a lot. It so there's a whole process for this. Oh, and by the way, I have your deposit sitting in my escrow, right? So I got to get you your money back and I got to get money from Bob, right? And we got to get this deal closed and we got to get the court to agree to pay all the costs and all that. It's quite the thing. Yeah. So, so this is why we don't want limited authority. <laughs> it's the short answer. It makes these just crazy. Yeah. Not only that, but like it makes it so that like if, if I'm a buyer and I open up escrow with you, it makes it so that somebody else can overbid me at the courthouse. So if the process takes mm -hmm. two to three months, but we're in a market where the market is going up like crazy, somebody may yep. be willing to overpay. Now, from a real estate perspective, do you ever see realtors get in trouble for failing to counter that it's subject to court confirmation? Like what happens if the real estate agent forgets or doesn't, doesn't counter that it's subject to court as a buyer? I didn't sign off that it was court confirmation. I have an agreement with the seller that it's not court confirmation. What type of liability uh, does that bring to the administrator? And mm -hmm. does that actually happen? Things, all kinds of things happen. <laughs> I will tell you in the real world, um, the administrator would have issues, right? The court, the court ultimately controls. Um, you as the buyer would still not prevail in my opinion, right? The court would ultimately 
you know, uh, uh, authorized whoever it is to buy it based upon the overbid process, which means you now have a breach of contract action against the administrator. Um, and you may have an, an, your agent should have known theoretically too. both sides. Agents should know what condition, you know, it should be in the MLS. It should be something that you guys as agents are talking about so that everybody's on the same page. Um, and, and so both agents might have potential liability as well, if it wasn't done properly. Would you say that this is important? This is my subtle pitch. Would you say that it's important for an administrator to hire a real estate agent that really understands the probate process? I, 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 and I think, and I, I, just like I said, you could do your own probate. You could sell your own house. I I don't recommend it (laughs) to anyone. Um, And because probate is, is unique, right? It's not the average sale. Having someone who understands and things that we're talking about, if they don't, your risk is high, right? You're taking it on risk. So I'm, I, I, I'm a fan of getting an agent who knows what they're doing in this space. So you're a fan of people hiring Jose Luis Morales, basically, in other words. All, all good, yeah. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Okay, what is a notice of proposed action and how does that uh, work from a real estate perspective? And what happens if the real estate agent does not include the notice of proposed action clause maybe in a probate or even a trust? Yeah, so again, that's going to go back to um, when we're dealing with limited authority. A trust is not going to have a notice of proposed action. Right. So in a trust situation, we're not dealing with court at all. No court action is opened up. Um, you're, you know, the, the, we're going to be dealing with affidavits and maybe attorneys, um, and in disposing of the property with the successor trustee. So it's, it's for limited circumstances. Got it. Now I've heard this, um, like, let's say that there's 10 beneficiaries, even in a trust and some of the beneficiaries maybe aren't amicable. Maybe some of them are fighting. Would it be good practice to send out a notice of proposed action just to basically let them know that the property is being sold and all of the terms associated with the sale? Or is that yes. just redundant? Um, with with a probate, yes, you want to put it out um, because there is an objection period relative to a probate case. Um, so I think it's 25 days that that we have to give that notice for. So you absolutely, again, once we have the probate open, um, we've already notified all of the heirs of the probate. So yes, we should be notifying them um, relative to the sale of the property. Um, it is a, the notice goes out, but they, the, 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 the not, there's nothing that has to be done from an escrow or title standpoint, unless there's an objection. So if someone doesn't want it to happen and they object once they get the notice, then we have to go to court, right? So that'll trigger us back into court to decide what to happen with the property. And it's a formal objection. It's not just, I don't want you to do this. No, you got to file in court that you're objecting. Yeah. What happens if half of the beneficiaries want to keep the property and the other half want to sell the property in a probate process? Well, the first thing would be, can the other the ones who want to keep it, can they afford it? Right. Mm -hmm. Because they have to buy out the other ones. Um, And you're going to be looking at it's similar to like what we talked about previously, which is like a partition action. Right. So you're going to be looking at um, who wants to keep it. Can they afford to what's the value of their property? Right. So we're looking at appraisals and valuation and um, all of this done through a court process. Yeah. How long would you say that the process typically takes from start to finish, basically? Uh, an uncontested probate is at least a year. Um, a year. A contested probate is at least a couple years. <laughs> and when we say a year, we're not talking – we're talking about like um, receiving the – so give us a timeline. Okay, day one yep. to letters of testamentary. What, 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 right. what is a typical timeline for an uncontested? Two to three months to get letters. Con- right? What about a contested? It it we could be you could spend a year just trying to get letters, right? Um, I I can tell you that depending on Ventura County is better than LA County, LA. right? With where we're at, um, we have one probate judge in Ventura County, and Ventura County's 
we're small. So our, our judge is pretty good um, as far as time. So you can get letters, like I said, in like two months, pretty much in Ventura County, um, at, absent a cont uh, something contested. But then hearings get set. Hearings are generally set three to four months at a time, right? Um, in LA, like I have a hearing on a motion that's set in like January right now. So, you know, something I filed a month ago is going to get a hearing eight months later. Right. So that's why if we're contesting who's even the administrator, we could be a year out before we even get letters. And then once we have letters, there's a whole process of there's notices that have to be done. Again, assets need to be marshaled, sold, distributed. Um, and then we have to file a petition at the end um, with the court. And then we got to get a hearing. And again, so if I file the petition today in Ventura County in probably three to four months, to get a hearing on that petition. I have one that we just got done last month that it was almost a year from the day we filed to get a hearing. Um, the courts got backed up with COVID. And so we're still even we, in probate, still managing some of that backlog. So timing to get hearings is is not great right now. Yeah. So maybe three months to get the letters. At that point, they can start selling the property. From the time mm -hmm. they sell the property, what happens after the property closes escrow? And this is a misconception as well, too. Does the money go into the beneficiary's account directly? Is there a closing <laughs> out of the estate process? And what does that look like as well, too? Yeah, so there's a the assets have to go into an account for the estate. Right. So that we get this all the time. I can't open a bank account. Yes, you can. <laughs> the estate has to the assets have to go into an account of the estate. Um, the the trustee can't put the money in their own accounts um, and it cannot get distributed directly to the beneficiaries. Again, we got to do it. There's a tax return that needs to be done if there's assets. Um, there's taxes that have to be paid. Those all need to happen before we distribute, because if not, uh, when Uncle Sam comes to call in, someone's going to have to pay the bill. Right. Mm -hmm. So. So, yes, the funds are put are set aside and and distributed based upon court authority relative to um, uh, the, the distribution rules of the, that particular probate. At what point does the family receive the money? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end, right? Ultimately, this stuff is is the assets are distributed at the end, just like when we get paid. Um, so things are, are are there. There's there's some rules. There's a thing called a homestead exemption, and right. So there's some some distribution. So like, if my spouse dies, I need to be able to function, right? I need to be able to pay the mortgage and and buy groceries and make the car payment. So there are certain allowances that are allowed, but for the most part, things are done distributed at the end. So let's say that um, letters three months, let's say it takes another three months to sell the property. That's month six. More than likely, if it takes a whole year for the probate process mm -hmm. at the end. Now, are there, what, what does the creditor process look like? Meaning like the money's in the bank. Mm -hmm. If, if let's say my father mm -hmm. passed away and he owed money to hospitals or uh, mm -hmm. convalescence home. What does that look like? What does that process look like? They make an application into the probate, right? So that's part of, remember how I said, when we open mm -hmm. the probate, we publish in the newspaper that that publication puts the public on notice so that creditors, if they're on notice, they file a petition into the probate to get paid. So there are times when the estate is worth less than what's owed. Um, <laughs> you know, there are people who are in debt more than they have assets. Right. And, um, in those cases, the creditors are going to eat up, um, eat up the assets. Got it. Um, who is the probate referee and what role does he play in the probate process? So a probate pre referee is, is like an appraiser. Their job is to value the assets of the estate. So they are required when there's real estate involved and they, they'll value different things, cars, um, uh, large assets get valued in a probate process. So they are, like I said, it's required because the court doesn't want something to be misvalued either up or down, 
right? So that it's unfair um, relative to the estate. So say, say we're not going to sell the house. Well, then we need to know what it's worth so that we can distribute. So that referee is going to set that value for the property for that purpose. Um, and they get paid for what they do. They are, they are officers of the court from a technical standpoint, um, but they get paid and their, their fee is based upon the value of the estate. So the more, just like the attorney's fee and the administrator's fee, the referee is paid based upon the value of the estate. What happens if the probate ref do are probate referees required to go inside of the house to give their valuation or is it an exterior BPO or exterior valuation? I, I mean, I think it probably depends on any particular circumstance, but it's not required. Got it. And what happens if they value it too high um, and the property is not worth that? Um, you could, you can, you can try to contest it. You're going to have a hard time. I will tell you the courts, um, place a lot of, um, weight on the opinion of the referee. And I have never seen one that was crazy that I was like, this, I have never seen it. I'm sure it happens, but yeah. it's not something I've seen. And then what I was going to ask you is, uh, did you go over the percentage? Like, let's say that they value it at 500,000. Is there a mm -hmm. certain percentage that as a administrator, I have to sell the property within that percentage in order for it not to like cause any issues with the court? There's not a statutory percentage. Uh -huh. Um, it, it, you're going to have to, it's going to be a weighing of the real world, right? So if it, if the referee says it's worth 500,000 and we list it at 500,000 and we get 10 offers at like 475, right? We're going to show that that's what was out there and what's available. That's market value. Right. So it's going to be it's going to be looked at from a in specific transaction point of view. Got it. Okay. Uh what is a step up in basis? The step up in basis has to do with capital gains, right? So um, when you own real estate, it's a capital asset from the from a taxing standpoint. Um, your basis, right? So we're talking about step up in basis. Your basis is the purchase price that you bought a house for. Um, so when you sell the house, the difference in what you bought it for, this is basics. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can change all this. But basics, if you buy a house at one price and you sell it at the other price, that difference is capital gains, right? Um there's a rule in the codes that says if you die, your basis steps up to the value at your death. So um, we like to let people die <laughs> in their houses because then we don't have to pay capital gains, right? So for example, I bought my house in 2000 for $200,000. My house is probably worth a million dollars now. So if I sold it, I would have $800,000 in capital gains on my house. Now, uh, for a principal residence, there's $500 exemption, 500,000 for me and my husband, right? But then we'd have, we'd have 300,000 that we'd have to pay capital gains on. But if we keep that house and we die, our kids' basis will be at that million dollars. So they would avoid that whole $800,000 capital gain. Um, so all this goes into decision-making. So like 1031 exchanges and other, you know, things like that are done to avoid these capital gains. Um, death is the best <laughs> avoider of capital gains because we step up in basis. Yeah. So basically, uh, one of the questions that I commonly get is when I inherit a property, do I have to pay taxes? And a lot of the times, not all the time, but a lot of the times because of the step up in basis, mm -hmm. they don't have to pay taxes, assuming they sell right away when the person passes away. And assuming in that holding period, the market doesn't go up three, four, five hundred uh, thousand dollars at that time. They won't have capital gains, but there is a state tax. So it, but the current dollar amount on state tax, I believe, is eleven million. It might be a little bit more. So unless the estate is worth more than that, they're not going to pay a state tax. But if it is, then they're going to pay a state tax. And one of the big things that's coming is the current estate tax amount is based upon a Trump tax, um, a Trump tax uh, bill that's going to expire. And are if they don't change it, it's going to go down to like two million. So estate like you're going to have a lot of people having a state tax that don't right now if Congress doesn't change the law in the next year or two. 
which is so, kind of crazy. Uh, it's basically like an inheritance tax that it's a, yep. there's a really high limit of 11 million plus another 11 million. It's per individual, right? So per for individual. a married couple, you can have uh -huh. up to $22 million in assets where if you inherit it, there's no taxes. But if it's, right. if it gets taken down to 2 million, almost right. everybody in California or certain parts of California would likely have right. an additional tax, which I've been told that is like 40% percent or something like that I, the gain the, it's complicated it depends on your economics and yeah. a, there's a whole bunch of things um but yes i mean in california capital gains on the sale of like a commercial property between state and uh, state and federal tax is like 40 percent mm -hmm. um and we're not even talking about property taxes which is a whole nother <laughs> Oh, another factor that comes into it because California has Prop 13, right? So Prop 13 um, limits the amount that an assessor can assess a property based upon um, when you bought it, your purchase price. Um, and there's only two core triggering events, sale or, um, or improvement. Well, a death is a sale. So if I bought, so my example, again, I bought my house for $200,000, it's worth a million, but I'm paying property taxes based upon a $200,000 value, not a million dollar value. I die, the taxes are now going to be based at a million dollar value. So my kids' property taxes are going to be way higher than what I was paying. Got it. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to add on that, if you wanted to know the the new value at the time of death of somebody, somebody there's a valuation called the date of death valuation. And then our offices mm -hmm. ha have done those for a lot of attorneys. So if you're Perfect. watching this and you need one of those, uh, we're happy to help. Uh, Jennifer, is there anything else as it relates to the probate process that you feel would be helpful to anybody watching this is maybe lost a loved one and is just trying to understand mm -hmm the dynamics of the probate process just know it's slow and you're dealing with courts so just don't expect things to move quickly um, and it's not for the court it's not an emotional process um, it's a business process so there there you know you you may go in there saying it's not fair uh, fair is not a word that goes into probate right it is statutory it's rigid rules it's not about what's right or wrong it's not about principle <laughs> you know we all have all these ideas that that is not what probate is about it is it is literally just a clearing house for assets the one other thing is there is one other way to avoid probate uh, that we didn't talk about which is a transfer upon death deed so there is a way if you're if you want your house to go to someone that you can um, do a deed for that to happen when you die i don't love the document but it is out there so something to know about and think about if really all you have is a house um, and you want your kid to get it you can you can do that and they'll get it when you die and they'll avoid probate um, uh, it is designed for that really limited purpose. Got it. Okay. And then here's the last question. And this is almost just not a pitch for you, but is it important for an attorney to hire or for a potential administrator to hire an attorney with probate experience and why? Yeah. Well, you definitely do want, if you're going to hire an attorney, you want an attorney who does probates. They are very different. You know, uh, Getting a law degree is a general degree, right? We learn all kinds of different law, but um, you don't want me handling your criminal case. <laughs> you don't want me handling your divorce, right? You don't want me handling, um, you know, your your child custody issues, right? I don't have the expertise in that. Um, you want you want the right tool for the job. So an attorney who is a probate attorney, um, who understands the rules, knows the court. Um, knows the process, knows how they get paid. <laughs> all, all those things are very, very important. A hundred percent. And I couldn't agree with that uh, anymore. Like I've had cases where somebody hires an eviction attorney to do a probate case and vice versa, <laughs> where the probate right. person is doing an eviction. And a lot of the times it doesn't end up very pretty, especially during no. COVID. Anybody that was not an unlawful detainer attorney or an eviction attorney that was trying to do those types, I just saw them like get uh, destroyed on that. Last thing, Jennifer, if somebody saw value in the interview you shared with them today and wanted to hire you or wanted to get in contact with your company, what is the best way for them to do that? Yep. So our website is www.relawapc.com. 
Um, uh, I'm on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and Instagram and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can email me, call me, any of those instant messenger me, <laughs> whatever. Um, we're glad to talk to people when they have needs. We do free initial consultations um, to determine if if we're the best fit for you and 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 you like us. Right. So um, and making sure we feel like we can give you value. Got it. I love it. Good. Well, I want to say thank you, Jennifer, for coming on the show and sharing uh, your information with us. We do have another episode with Jennifer. It's about a partition action. So if you haven't seen that, that's a very good episode to watch. Uh, for our viewers out there, if you have not subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this interview would be helpful for a friend, family, or neighbor, make sure to hit that share button. Once again, Jennifer, thank you so much from the bottom of our heart and our viewers until next time.